It is finally time to start recording the Mechanical History of Yu-Gi-Oh! A longitudinal study on how the game has developed and evolved over time, segmented into discrete eras. It is always interesting to see design space being theorized in one set, then explored and expounded upon later. I am going to start by looking at spells and traps, then monsters in the next video. In the Duel Monsters era, Spells and traps had relatively simple effects. Burn damage, conditional destruction, bounce, special summoning, or drawing. There are also attempts at lockdown with fledgling floodgates. Spells and traps have always been regarded as somewhat lower value than monsters, looking at how much easier it is to destroy a spell or trap with cards like Mystical Space Typhoon or Breaker the Magical Warrior, while Monster Destruction is relatively more expensive when looking at cards like Tribute to the Doomed. Although, because of the lack of a normal summon to restrict spells and traps, the two card types can be activated with relative ease. Normal spells have an effect, then leave the field. Burn spells lose card advantage. Mass Destruction effects can lead to a shift in card advantage in your favor. However, the underlying principle with normal spell cards is single use, which also applies to ritual and quick play spells. We understand recurring a spell is valuable when looking at the limitation of Magician of Faith and Dark Magician of Chaos. To adjust the power level of these cards, there may be a cost, which is an important keyword. When Tribute to the Doomed is activated, you must discard a card. This is the cost which is an activation requirement. If your opponent negates your Tribute to the Doomed, you will not get the discarded card back. Costs are designated by periods and semicolons. Later problem-solving text more clearly indicates a cost, as well as activation conditions. Common costs are paying life points, discarding cards, and tributing monsters. Do note that monsters tributed for a ritual spell card are not a cost. In the event that a ritual spell is negated, no monsters will be tributed. In this era of Yu-Gi-Oh, ritual summoning is a secondary function for the stars on monsters, with the ritual spell describing the total number of stars necessary to perform the ritual summon, which is sometimes an exact number and sometimes a threshold which must be met and may be exceeded. Early ritual spells were specific to a single monster, although more generic spells did arise late in the DM era. Both normal and ritual spells are spell speed 1, which restricts the cards to be activated only during the turn player's main phases, as chain link 1. Quick play spells are faster, at spell speed 2, allowing them to be activated as chain links higher than 1, and even allows the quick play spell to be activated at most any time during the turn player's turn, even in the damage step if the card affects attack and or defense points. When set, quick play spells may also be activated during the opponent's turn. The faster spell speed allows for more initiative, which is counterbalanced with weaker effects. The single-use nature of normal, ritual, and quick play spells, combined with their relatively simple effects, does not lead to interesting design space yet, at least compared to the more permanent spells. Continuous spells remain on the field after activation although some examples have a self-destruct feature to limit their impact. While on field, these spells can offer some sort of benefit, which may be a continuous-like effect, with an example being spell economics, which removes the life point costs from spell cards, or trigger-like in the case of soul absorption, with the life point gain effect being triggered each time a card is banished. Continuous spells may also have ignition-like effects, with the case of Mass Driver, where, as a spell speed 1 effect, the turn player may tribute a monster to inflict damage. One interesting aspect of continuous-like effects is the beginning of Floodgate cards, which limit player actions in some way, like how Prohibition can designate one particularly troublesome card to prevent it from being used, which is design space also explored in many early counter cards. Field spells are similar to continuous spells, but offer symmetric effects to both players. Although early field spells were rather anemic, offering only marginal effects, 
Some standouts were cards like A Legendary Ocean, which functioned as Yumi, as well as decreased the levels of all water monsters in the hand and on the field by one. In many cases, allowing strong monsters to be normal summoned with fewer tributes. Fusion Gate mitigates some of the inherent disadvantage of the fusion summon by acting as multiple copies of polymerization. Finally, there is the field spell Floodgate of Necro Valley, which largely shut off access to the graveyard for both players. The continuous and field spells are interesting, but I think the most exploration of spell design space was with equip spells. Equip spells are a bit of a special case, as they require a monster to be on the field. This can actually be a monster on either side of the field in some cases. On your side of the field, equip cards can offer stat boosts, partial immunity, or even resurrect monsters. On your opponent's monsters, they afford restrictions on attacking, changing battle positions, and even just stealing a monster outright. Being forced to have a monster to equip to makes equip spells situational. And, since they are destroyed when the monster leaves the field, there is a good chance that playing equip spells will lead to a loss of card advantage. To mitigate this, many early equip spells had some sort of destruction trigger effect or an attempt at recursion. Black Pendant inflicts damage when destroyed. Although telegraphed, Smoke Grenade of the Thief can discard a card from the opponent's hand. Malevolent Nuzzler, Horn of the Unicorn, and Sword of the Deep Seated place themselves back on the top of the deck. Flint equips itself to another valid target, and Abicio Drachmord returns to hand after it destroys the monster. Speaking of returning to hand, Butterfly Dagger Elma had that effect, finding itself on the ban list due to loops with Gearfried the Iron Knight. Butterfly Dagger Elma is actually a member of the Guardian series, which were a terribly restricted monster lineup which required specific equip cards to be on the field in order to be summoned, and had underwhelming effects when on the field. Requiring a certain card to be on the field, they are reminiscent of Toon Monsters, but arguably worse. Moving on to traps, we have Normal, Continuous, and Counter Traps. All traps must be set a turn before they may be activated. This restriction puts traps a turn slower than spell cards, but does open the ability to respond to your opponent's cards and actions. Additionally, some traps have an activation requirement or condition. The most common activation condition at the time was declaration of an attack. This was the golden age of battle traps, with a few examples even ending up on the ban list. We see the trend of floodgates continue with continuous traps, with restriction on attacking, activating spell cards, and even against other trap cards. Some of these cards have a maintenance cost, such as fairy box requiring 500 life points per turn. The spell speed 2 nature of continuous traps means that they can be activated as an ambush tactic to shut out an opponent after they have committed to a line of play. On top of that, activating a continuous trap on your opponent's turn may result in a turn of disproportionately asymmetric effect, with cards like Skull Invitation being chained to Graceful Charity for unexpected burn damage. Perhaps the best counterplay with traps lies with counter traps, if you could believe it. At spell speed 3, counter traps may only be responded to with other counter traps. There is an emphasis toward negation in this design, often with either a steep cost, like discard for magic jammer, or half your life points for solemn judgment, or they have a very restrictive activation requirement, like rear yoku field, only negating spells which target exactly one monster on the field, or trap jammer, only negating trap cards activated during the battle phase. A good counter in the golden age of battle traps. The potential impact of spells and traps is reflected in the difficulty in their recursion, as only a few cards may return spells and traps to the hand, as compared to the numerous ways to recur monsters. In the context of a slower metagame, and before the ubiquity of effect monsters, simple spells and traps are paramount in the dual monsters era, composing the majority of the band list at the time. That being said, the design space explored with monster effects is much broader, varied, and bizarre.